your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the book of Mark, chapter 1. There I am. Wow. I'm pretty lively up here. I won't have to talk very loud, will I? Mark, chapter 1. I guess I better turn there, too. Uh, here in Mark, I'm going to read verses uh, 14 and 15. Uh, the first chapter of Mark, and this was where we were at last week, back to the basics. Salvation uh, is the most important truth that a person can discover in their life, and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. There is a reason why I'm trying to emphasize to you to hand out the Gospel of Romans and John and get people back. Uh, we have a lot of things in our church, and I like the things. We have, uh, people tell me we have more meals than any other church. Uh, I kind of like those. People that watch me online say, you have more fellowship meals than about anybody we know. Well, good, come on over and fellowship with us. We have lots of food. We like food. And uh, people do a good job. Uh, we have other events, outreach, like I was talking about. But in all of that, where we have the back to school and we give away backpacks and all that and try to help, and we're taking up offerings for the pregnancy center, I think all that's good. But it is the Word of God which will change the heart and life, Amen. not uh, something about our church. Amen. This is a good church, one of the best churches. Uh, it's not the best church I've ever pastored it's close to it. Yes, sir. We have a good, good fellowship here. And I tell people that often. I really do. Uh, you folks are good folks. You love the Lord and we don't have uh, all that fussing and fighting. I've been in some places where, man, I had to hide on Sunday morning in the Lord <laughs> I'm serious. Because it was such a downer when people would catch me at the door and tell me who they didn't like and what was going on and all that kind of nonsense. Man, uh, I don't have that here, so I'm out here in your way on Sunday morning. I don't hide out. But uh, we have good folks, good fellowship. But uh, with all the fellowship we have, it is the Word of God that changes lives. Amen. And so, uh, what are the basic truths? This message is about back to the basics. Mark chapter 1, this is the first sermon of Jesus. Right after his baptism, by John and then by John the Baptist. And you remember at the baptism, uh, the Father spoke from heaven, the Holy Spirit came down as a dove, and all three of the Trinity there. He went in the wilderness, was tempted by the devil. And uh, right after he came back out of that wilderness experience of those 40 days of fasting, we find Jesus stepping forth and delivering his first message. It says, now after that, John the Baptist was put into prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So this is his first message. And saying, here's what the message was. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Uh, these messages, these two, are about getting back to the basics. The requirements of salvation are repentance and faith. Two inseparable truths. Uh, I quoted last week John Calvin, a great theologian of the Reformation, who said, Can true repentance exist without faith? By no means. Although they cannot be separated, they ought to be distinguished. It's two parts, but one act. So last week I spoke on repentance. The word repent means to uh, change your thinking, uh, to turn around or to change your mental attitude and direction. That's what repent means. In fact, repentance is not being sorry for your sin. Some people think that. That's not repentance. Repentance is not reform reformation. It's not regret. It's not realization. The old uh, Hebrew term uh, speaks of the fact uh, by the prophets that a prominent idea there was a radical change in somebody's attitude, one's attitude towards sin and toward God. Now that implies a conscious moral 
and personal decision to forsake sin, but it is your change of thinking, your change of attitude about the direction you're going. Repentance and faith are two heads of the same coin. It is one act, but you have to get to the place of recognizing you're a sinner. You know, I'm sitting here thinking, I don't often talk about this because I'm a little ashamed of it, but I sit here thinking as uh, Barb was singing this morning, uh, this message was in my mind, and I remember how miserable I was apart from Christ. Uh, I was 18, uh, almost 19 when I got saved, so I'd have been right in that era uh, the week or two before that. I remember sitting in the backyard of the trailer in which I was living, and my life on the outside looked great. Had a good job. In fact, uh, I had this job for many years, and I was getting a better job already in line that had been promised it wasn't there yet but I had a good job and I got paid well and I had a place to live and I had some money in the bank I had some cattle on my dad's farm and uh, everything looked prosperous everything looked great on the outside but on the inside I was miserable what did life hold and I remember sitting out back, I was, uh, I sat in a chair out back in the field, five acre field, there behind that. And I was looking out in that field and I was cleaning my 22 rifle. And I thought, you know what, this is all there is to life, this hurting inside. I don't think I want to continue. And then it dawned on me how my mother would react if I did something very foolish. But I was miserable inside. I remember that feeling. Sometimes people forget what it's like to be lost. But I'm telling you, when Jesus comes, everything changes. Amen. Yeah. And so the first message was about repentance. Coming to the place of realizing the path you're on is the wrong direction. And you need to change directions. It starts with... Uh, up here thinking about, wait a minute, i got a change in the way I'm headed. This, this is not right. The second part of this is, while, in, while repentance emphasizes the negative part, to believe is the positive side, not a turning from, that's turning from sin, but a turning to Christ in faith. So Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. And Jesus' first message consists of two declarations, two commands. First, he declared that the time that God had predicted in the Old Testament had arrived. The kingdom of God is here, it's at hand. That which God had predicted. And then he says, because it's at hand and I'm here, I am commanding people everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. Now, it's interesting, uh, these two words call for successive action, but really the action uh, involves two steps taken simultaneously, repent and believe. You cannot have repentance, true repentance without faith. You cannot have true faith without repentance. You have to turn from something to turn to something. To turn to something, you have to turn from something. Repentance is, say, is a matter of saying, i got to turn from the way I'm living. Where do you turn? You turn to Christ. That's what it said. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, for example, a drowning man who's out there in the water and the lifeguard jumps in and gets to him has to do two things simultaneously. He's got to let go of the little board he's hanging on and grasp the lifeguard. He'll be in trouble if he doesn't let go and get a hold. Salvation in that sense is like that, repentance and faith. It's one act, but it's simultaneously repenting or turning from your sins and trusting Christ. What does it mean here 
when Jesus says to believe. You see, the term believe used many times in the New Testament, about 120 some times. And the term believeth is used another 40 uh, sometimes, about 41 times. And the most famous verse in all the Bible is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What does it mean to believe biblically? Well, the ISB, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, speaks of that old word belief or uh, faith, pistos, faith. Uh, it says it occurs frequently as a regular description of those professing their faith in Christ and those who have attached themselves to the Christian church. In other words, belief is seen to have, are you a believer? That's what it's used, of course. Him that believeth, what does that mean to believe? Well, first of all, we know this. It is not a mental assent to a historical fact. James tells us the following in James 2.19. He said, Thou believest there is one God. Thou doest well. And then he says this, The demons also believe and tremble. Now, simple intellectual recognition of the fact that God is God, that Jesus is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, a simple intellectual historical fact, believing that is not biblical saving faith. How do you know that? Because the demons know God is God. They know that fact. They know Jesus is Jesus. They know that fact. Do they believe he died on, they know he died on the cross. They were here. Do they believe he came out of the They know he came out of the grave. They were here. Well, uh, what about those demons? They are not saved because it's not possible for them to be saved. They have no redeemer. It is mankind that Jesus died on the cross for. You and I, why I'll never figure out, technically and theologically, if you get in one of those classes, he might have died for the race of angels, but he didn't. He died for the disobedience and sin of mankind whereby we might be saved. And so the demons, in a sense, believe or they know a fact. To know a fact doesn't mean that you're going to heaven. There are so many people that say, well, I believe Jesus uh, came to this earth. I believe that Christmas story. I believe he died on the cross when he came out of the tomb. Therefore, I must be going to heaven. Wait a minute. Belief is a call for action. You see, uh, there are so many action terms associated with this in the Bible. When Peter preached to those Jewish crowds on Pentecost, and I quoted this last week, after he spoke, he spoke of action. He said, uh, you know, repent, 238, be baptized. Or repent, 319, you need to repent and be converted, turned around or you need to repent and turn to, to, to God. When Paul spoke to Agrippa, he said these words, repent and turn to God. In other words, there's an action attached to this thing of believing. Do you really believe that Jesus is the Christ? In that term believing, it doesn't just mean you have it up here, but there's an action involved. So we find the following. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Another place he said, if any man will come to me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. There's an action required, not a mental assent to some fact. So while the demons believe, they can't come to Christ. Now follow me on this. There are so many people in this world, in this country, that say, oh yeah, I've known that Jesus came to this earth. I've believed in that ever since I was born. I've had people tell me that many times. Now, preacher, yes. But have you responded turning from the way you're headed unto him? There's an action required. Right. The Apostle John wrote it this way. In John chapter 1, 10 through 12, speaking of Jesus, he was in the world and the world was made by him. The world knew him not. He came into his own, that's the Jews, and they received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to be the sons of God, 
to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. As many as received him, that's an action, to take hold of him or to take him. You see, if you truly believe, it is an action term. Now, we do this all the time. Uh, if you come in and you look at that pew and you see it's got a broken leg. I was at a place the other day and I, I walked in and they had pews. And I looked at one and I said to myself, self, if you sit in that pew, that thing's liable to give way. Look at it. It was missing one leg. And another one was crooked in the old church. And I said, man, that looks dangerous. I don't believe that's worth me trusting. I said, none of you. You see, if I went in and said, okay, and jumped in on it, that means I believed and trusted it to hold me up. Belief is always an action term. It's not just a mental thing. And so uh, John says, but as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. So the writer of Hebrews challenging those uh, believers who are young in the Lord and who are not growing properly to move forward. There in chapter 6, coming out of chapter 5, he said, you ought to be teachers, but you're at the place you need to be taught again, the very first principles. And so he said, I'll read the Amplified because I think it helps us here. Let us not again be laying the foundation of repentance and abandonment of dead works and of faith by which you turn to God. Actually, he said, the very first principles are turning from the dead works, that's repentance, turning, changing your mind about how you're living, and turning in faith to God. He said, those are the very foundational principles of salvation. That's what Jesus said. So uh, what does it mean to believe? It carries with it an action. If you sit out on the front step this morning, I see you sitting out there, and I go out after church, and you say, I say, well, how come you don't go start your car? And you say, well, I don't believe it's going to start. You know why you turn the key or push the button? Because you believe it's going to do that. Why do you believe that? Because it's always done that when you push the button and you're surprised if it doesn't, you realize it's a possibility because it's mechanical, but belief causes action. Jesus said, I want you to repent. The kingdom of God's arrived. Repent and believe the gospel. But what are we to believe? Now this is interesting. Let me give you some verses. It's interesting how the Bible presents biblical belief. It talks about a heart belief. Romans chapter 10. It says in 9 and 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved. That's interesting. For with the heart Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confessions made to salvation. Not just confession, but believing in your heart. Why did Paul say that? What does he mean, believing in your heart? He, is he talking about that organ that beats inside your chest? No. The heart was the center of the being, because the heart's in the center of your chest. They related it to that. It wasn't the cardio, the pumping organ. It's the center of the being, of who you are. Center of man's, uh, or the seat of man's emotions and intellect and moral faculties, the heart. It includes your emotions, it includes your mind, it includes your will. It's you. You believe with your heart, Paul says. What does that mean? You believe. With your mind, you understand Jesus died on the cross. Your emotions are stirred by the Holy Spirit, but of your own free choice, you choose to turn from the life you're living and turn to Christ. It's an action. Believing in the heart. Now, we sing songs about that. Is thy heart right with God? What does that mean? Are you right with God? Have you straight, uh, squared away with God? Got things straight? 
We sing invitations like this, just as I am, without one foot. But that thy blood was shed for me. And at the end of that we say, I come. Action. I believe Jesus died on the cross. What do you got to do? Well, I just believe that. No, there's an action involved. And so Paul says, uh, we believe with the heart. Oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come. Why? Because in faith, you're turning to him. You have turned from your old life. You're turning in faith to him. Now, it also says in the Bible that we're to believe on his name. <clears throat> and this is the commandment, John 1, 23, first of one, uh, 3, 23, excuse me. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, it follows it up in 5, 13. These things have I written in you, this great verse, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe on the name of the Son of God. It's present tense. Believing on the name of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That you believe it's a historical fact that Jesus came to this earth? I've only met one person who did not believe Jesus was a historical figure. And she happened to be the pastor of the church Good. that I interviewed. And she said, oh, I don't believe that Jesus was even a historical figure. She got to be out of her tree. She'd go back in history and see that he was here. That's the only person I, most people say, oh, yeah, 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 I believe, yeah, uh, history books. Here. But what does it mean here to believe on the name of Jesus? We believe he was named Jesus? That's a historical fact. What does that mean? To believe in the name of Jesus Christ is to accept Jesus Christ for what he really is, what he said he is, what he did. It's to believe his words as well as his being. He said he was and is one with the Father. He was and is the Messiah, the Christ, proving it by his miracles. And to believe on his name is to believe his character and who he said he is, he is. And so, when the psalmist wrote, our help is in the name of the Lord, he doesn't mean that our help lies in the fact that God's name is Yahweh or Job, but that he is who he said he is and will deliver. So to believe on his name is to believe what he said and who he is. And so John says, I write to you that believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. You have to come to the place of saying Jesus is who he said he is, and I'm going to go this direction with him in faith, trusting him. Wow. So what did Jesus mean? And, and I could give you several of these, but what did Jesus mean when he said, the kingdom of God's at hand? I am commanding men everywhere. You need to repent and believe the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, preacher, what does that word mean? That Greek word, euangelion, means it is a good message. Oh, you know this. The good news. Believe the good news or the good message. Believe the message. Turning from your sin. Now, this is real basic, isn't it? Repent. Change your mind about the way you're living. And believe the message, the good message. Why is it a good message? Well, it encompasses, I can give you about 16 of these, but I'm going to give you about four. It encompasses the good news of the truth. Colossians 1, 5, I'll read this verse. It says, uh, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before, in the word of truth, the gospel. The good news of truth is encompassed in the gospel. Until Jesus came to earth, men only broke after God. Can you imagine coming this morning and the closest you could get was out there under the canopy and I'd meet you out there and say, let me take your gift. Let me take that best lamb you got. Or let me take your free will offering, whatever it is. I'll take it in. I'll put it on the altar. That's as close as you can get to God. You can't come any closer. There's a separation there. Jesus said the kingdom of God has arrived. I'm here. That which I've been talking about since Genesis 3.15 has now arrived. You have the opportunity 
to turn your change your thinking about sin and turn to me and believe the most wonderful news of truth. You don't have to grope after God. God is here right among us. That's the gospel. And so in the Old Testament, they're hoping to find, seeking somehow the truth. Uh, God might come one day. He's right. He's here. We've been celebrating Christmas all this time. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Because we say he's come. He came as a babe, born of a virgin. He arrived. He arrived. He arrived. Amen. The truth. That's part of the gospel. The good news of hope. 123 of Colossians, just the next page, says this. Uh, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature who's under heaven, where I and Paul have made a minister. The ancient world was a harsh world to live in. Difficult world. I mean, they had to gather water. Yeah, we have it so easy. You bunch of sissies, you have it easy. You uh, go home and you turn the faucet. There comes water. You ought to have to go down uh, to the well and get the water. Or Brother Jim, West Virginia, Missouri, down to the creek, the spring, and, <laughs> and get the water. He understands that. Lord, and carry the water. And then uh, they didn't have electricity. Now they do today. Last time I was in Israel, I looked at the Bedouins, at, at the, the tenders, sheep tenders. I looked at out there and they way out in the desert and I thought what a meager existence and I looked behind the tent there was a battery and a TV on I saw in there they, they have TV and they have cell phones today too so uh, electronics has gotten everywhere it was a harsh world they were living in they lived very meager lives most of them did not have enough food to satisfy them except for its folks they lived a meager existence, a harsh life, a difficult life. And Jesus said, in the midst of this, there is the hope of the gospel. It gives hope to mankind. I mean, Jesus is alive, and because he's alive, and because he's arrived, there's hope now. Amen. You don't just live and die and think that maybe God one day will send the Savior. He's come to this earth. It's the gospel of hope. It is the gospel or the good news of peace. Like the troubled sea, as Isaiah said, whose waters cast up mire and dirt, churning always back and forth. The unsaved man inside is always churning, and he never can get a real settled peace. You remember those days? Back and forth and up and down, and like that ocean, like the seashore, it's always back and forth. But in Christ, in Christ, that turmoil can end the God's good news of peace. Jesus said, I came to bring peace. And so he proclaimed, my peace I'll give unto you. You can be at peace with yourself and with the world. But we have forgotten what it was like to be in that turmoil after we're saved. Man to think, I'm at peace. I go to bed at night in peace. That's the good news of the gospel. It's the good news of peace. It is also the good news of life. Now, real life, real living with purpose and direction. Joy and happiness. Jesus said plainly, I am the bread of life and the bread of living. I am the sustenance for real life. What uh, do you need? What you need to have a full and happy life? I've got it. Bread was what they used to fill the body. He said, I'm the bread of living of life. You say, well, uh, my life's wrapped up in my job. We used to uh, joke about those on the assembly line. You might not like this, but we used to joke with them. And they would say, well, I, you know, they couldn't do without me. And we'd say, oh, you die on this end of the line, they'll push you over and after the, after the ship, they'll put somebody else in after the ship, they'll drag you out. <laughs> the guy said, well, that, that, you know, GM Ford and all these companies, they couldn't survive without me. Who are you kidding? You work there so you can buy groceries. I understand this. Good place to work. 
I grow some I've done places. Jesus said, I am the bread, the sustenance of real living. I'm the bread of life. And uh, he said, what you need to have a full and happy life, I've got. So he said, I have come that they might have life. And they might have it more abundantly. Abundant life. It means a life with surplus. I have come that they might have life and it's full and overflow. It's a surplus life. It's not just a meager little bit of happiness. It just overflows. One place he said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. So the Spirit lives within us. Wow! It's not just a meager existence and say, well, I might go to heaven one day. It's an abundant life here and now. Christians are happy, happy, happy. So we sing songs. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. It's a happy life. You remember what it's like not to be saved? I tell you what. To go to bed at night and to talk to the Lord and get up the next morning and say hello and to have this life, even in the midst of turmoil, when I was a young pastor, I used to be amazed. I would go to the hospital and see a dear saint. And I would think, man, they're in bad shape. I don't know what I'm going to say to them. What do I say to somebody? And I'd come in and say, hey, preacher, I'm happy in Jesus. I get it now. Even in the hospital bed, were they happy they were hurting and, and uh, they had, no, they They'd rather be. But God supplies. Amen. He supplies the joy. Amen. Amen. And it's an odd. We talked about this the other day. I was talking to my wife. It's an odd thing. When you bury your parents. Or a parent. Odd thing. And you haven't experienced that. That's a sad day. It really is. But it's an odd feeling when they're a believer. On the one hand, you're broken hearted because there's a gap there and you won't be able to talk to them for a while. I woke up the other day and I thought, I wish I could call Dad. I had a question and I knew he would know about this. But I don't have a telephone line to help. I can pray about it, but I wish I'd get him on the line and say, hey, I got a question about this whole thing and I knew he would know because you know all that. You've been through it. It's an odd feeling that on the one hand you say I'm sad and broken hearted and on the other hand I know where they're at. I haven't lost them. Yeah. And God sent you this amazing joy. You almost feel ashamed about it. Now, if I die next week and I'm laying here, please don't come by and start dancing. People want to understand. <laughs> but I want you to have joy. Don't come by and go, Whoo! He's gone, he's gone, he's gone. Oh, it's great, he's gone. No, no. At least act like you're sad a little bit. Then get outside and go, woo, he's gone. But uh, there is an odd thing there. Isn't it? You guys experience that. What is that? It's because we know they have life. And the Holy Spirit gives us joy even in the midst of sadness. There's that joy of the Lord. He said, I've come that you would have life and you'd have it more abundantly, overflowing in all of things. You have an overflowing life, a surplus life. I never realized that when I got saved. I really didn't. But the journey is amazing with Jesus. You're never, never without. It. And even when things don't go well, there's a choice. So I said, Barbara, that's good. She was looking for a microphone that would actually work. The battery was going out, all this electronic. But she just still had the joy. You know, the world threw the mic and said, hey, what's going on? You see, they don't have much joy, but the Holy Spirit blessed that song and you hit it just like water blessing. And there's just joy. Not only is it abundant life, it's eternal life. 2 Timothy 1.10 But now it's made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light.
through the gospel. The good news of life, living. Not only here, but why? I not only can have truth and joy and peace and abundance, I have all that peace and hope and all that and many, many other things. But the gospel is a gospel of not only abundant living, but everlasting living. You're not going to get rid of me when I leave this world. If you go to heaven. We're going to be together. Amen. Eternal. Ever, think about that. Wow. It, I'm headed on the wrong path, which is death and destruction and misery here. I ain't changing my mind about this. I believe I'd like to follow the good news. Amen. Amen. Because in it is peace. And some of you don't have any peace inside. And hope. You don't have much hope in this life. And uh, in it is life in Christ. Real, abundant life. Joy, and happiness, and wow, eternal life. So you say, well, I know I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, I need to repent. I need to change my attitude about sin and the direction I'm headed. So, uh, I'm just going to turn around. Now, I'm going to turn, make a turn. I'm going to start helping people. I'm going to get involved in, in helping the poor. That's, that's nice to help the poor. I'm going to get involved in giving to the needy. I'm for giving to the needy. I'm going to get involved in religion. Religion, not bad. But that's not what he said. Jesus didn't say, repent. Just, just change your mind. Repent and believe the gospel. You can't just get over here and feel sorry. By the way, some of them say, they added to this, it doesn't mean repentance, it doesn't mean penance, but they try, oh, I'll just, I'll just say so many prayers and I'll give some. No. Jesus said, repent, believe the gospel. Oh, you say, I like that stuff about believing the gospel. That's what I want to do. I just want the good news. I want the good life. I want life. I want happiness. And so uh, they say something like this. I'm just knowing he's loving and kind. And he's a wonderful person. I hope he'll accept me. I'm going to count on that. Sincerely, I'm going to say, Jesus, I believe you. Jesus didn't say just believe. He said, you got to change your mind about where you're headed. You can't just say, I'm going to take Jesus and continue on the wrong path. Amen? Amen. Amen. Repent and believe. Over here is real life, real living. Change your mind, turn around, turn to me. In me, you have real life. I'm concerned about American Christianity. We are so, and there's nothing wrong with telling people to accept Jesus. I'm not sure that's a good term. I'm glad he accepted me. Mm -hmm. But we're so bent on trying to get people to come to the place of faith, we forget that Jesus said, this is the basic of the gospel, change your mind, turn to me. Repent and believe the gospel. If you'll do that, he'll save you. He promised he would. Amen. And you'll have abundant life, overflowing, bubbling out, and eternal life. It's for everyone who repent and believe. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Has there come a time in your life when you said yes to Jesus, who said yes to the cross? And you said, man, I, I know I'm saved because I've done what Jesus asked. I came to a place in my life I, I knew I needed to turn around and I turned to Christ. Maybe you're here and you say uh, I'm miserable inside. I've never done that. Why don't you do that? Jesus said repent and believe. Come unto me all you that labor. Change your mind about yourself. Believe with your heart. The whole person. Turn to me. Follow me. Receive me, John said. 
some action. I wonder today that you have the assurance of salvation. How do I know I'm saved? Well, Jesus said, my sheep, but I know them. They know me and they hear my voice and they follow me. That's a sheep. Jesus said, uh, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. His Spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. Romans 8, you're a child of God. And so we look inside. As soon as you get saved, He sends the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. And you know you're saved. You've met His conditions and you have the evidence. Oh yeah, believers have good works, but that comes when you believe, not do. That doesn't mean anything about salvation. It just means you appreciate the Lord. You want to do good works. Have you turned and believed? Well, I haven't done that. Why don't you do that this morning? I want us to stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Come back word of prayer. Now, we have some altars if you'd like to come and pray, but you don't have to do that. In order to be saved, you must turn to Christ, turn from the path you live. The only joy and happiness is found in the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. Would you do that today, Heavenly Father? As we sing this invitation for those who are online, those who are here, I pray that this very basic message of last week and this week, repentance and faith, simple requires one act turning from and turning to it cannot be separated it can be distinguished as John Calvin said and I'm thankful for the day that I came to you turning from the path I was on and just giving my life to you believing the gospel acting on that by receiving you as my Savior and Lord. The Lord has not been the same since. Because we know if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Wow. What a wonderful life it is to be saved and living for you. It's not about religion, it's about relationship with you. And I pray if there be anybody here online that's not saved, truly really saved this morning, that they'll turn from their sin and turn to you. Change their mind about sin, their attitude. And turn to you. One act. If they turn today, they can be saved. Might it be so?